Hi, everyone. My name is Travis Rector, and I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Alaska. And I'm one of the organizers for a group called Astronomers for Planet Earth, which is an organization of professional astronomers, educators, and students who are working to address the issue of climate change. Today's talk is part of our webinar series where we are looking into what things we can do. And I'm especially excited to have Dr. Rosemary Barnes with us uh, because she is an expert on the technologies that are coming into play to address the climate change issue. Now, this is the Q&A session. And if you're watching this recording, I encourage that you first watch the uh, video that Rosie recorded for us uh, some time ago. The link for that will be in the comments. So Rosie, thank you again for taking the time to join us. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for, for inviting me to speak to you. Sure. So first off, I wanted to say, uh, just as a shameless plug for Rosie's YouTube channel, I love watching <laughs> Rosie's videos because um, every week she's coming up with new and interesting examples of things that are not only cool solutions for climate change, but just cool period things that you think, wow, that's really neat. I can't wait until I can have that in my house or my community. And so it's, especially if you're feeling down in the dumps about climate change, you know, especially scientists were constantly inundated with, you know, gloom and doom. Uh, Rosie's channel is a real antidote to that. It's a, it's a great opportunity to, to, you know, feel some optimism for what the future holds. And that's something that I really took away uh, from your talk, Rosie, was about uh, just that, the optimism that we should have. And so, um, like many of the people in my group, I teach an introductory astronomy class where I do talk about the issue of climate change. And I give my students, as part of a homework assignment, uh, an opportunity to ask questions. And when I say opportunity, what I really mean is I, I force them to ask questions. And the most common question I get, and this was true this semester as well, is, um, just climate doomism. Is it too late? What are the things we can do? Um, is it possible to, to get our act together? And in your talk, you talked about a lot of those things, but I'm just curious if you're talking to, you know, like a teenager or a young adult who, who may be in college or uni, uh, what, what's, you know, the, the, the short answer you give them about why we should be optimistic about our situation? I think um, the the change has already happened in most of the you know technology the technologies that make most of emissions in the world. The, the change has actually already happened, and if you're looking at the the climate, that's like the very last step in a line of you know like um, uh, ca cause and effect, and there's a big lag between. Uh, you know, the actions that we have done versus actually seeing the the impact in, in the climate. And so I think that that doesn't get a lot of attention, which causes people to think and say that we've done nothing at all. And, um, you know, that's every time there's a climate summit, that's what you that's what you see and hear is, you know, nothing's being done and blah, blah, blah. But actually, a, a lot has been done. And I don't think that it's just important because, you know, it's nice to feel optimistic. Um, I think it's important because in a lot of ways, um, people who get really worried about the climate crisis, they can spend their effort on something that is kind of already taken care of. And so it's not the right place to spend the effort. I'll give the example of in Australia at the moment, we're just um, about to have a, another federal election and the Greens Party, um, their major climate change policy is to renationalise all the coal power plants and close them down by 2030. And to me, that's just a terrible climate policy because it's going to happen anyway. And, you know, the early 2030s, um, it, just through economics, um, you were already seeing coal power plants close down years and years earlier than they were expected to, um, you know, even recently. So I would much rather see that um, climate activists were focusing on the, the remaining problems, um, which is largely to do with rolling out the new technologies fast. You know, like there's so much focus on stopping fossil fuels, but because the technologies are probably further ahead than most people realize, we'll get there faster, not by stopping fossil fuels, but by 
paving the way for renewables. And that means like really boring engineering stuff, like more power lines and um, <laughs> even more boring bureaucratic stuff, like, you know, um, simplifying the approvals that are needed to, you know, get new projects off the ground and new business models for using electricity so that, you know, um, rooftop solar and distributed energy can, can play a bigger and more efficient part. So, yeah, I, that's that's what I go on and on and on about when <laughs> when people ask me how the transitions, uh, you know, if we're going to get there fast enough. Okay, that's great. Um, you know, living in Australia, you can relate to us Americans in that you have a government which is, to put it politely, somewhat hostile towards <laughs> renewable energies. Um, and yet you still have this optimism that it's unstoppable. Uh, how important do you think it is for governments to incentivize renewables, to incentivize uh, development of new technologies? Or is it really just a situation of no matter what they try to do, uh, it's going to happen? What do you think? I think that governments can help the energy transition in, in two ways. The first and most obvious and what we've seen in the past is government supporting technologies in their early phase before it's commercial. Because with new technologies, um, and I mentioned it briefly in the video, the more of a new product that you make, the, the cheaper it gets. And it, it's usually every time you double the, um, the volume of production, then you'll have a, you know, a set decrease in cost. So, you know, you might double the number of um, solar panels and it's 10% cheaper um, after doubling and then double it again, another 10%. So you get big cost reductions in that early phase. Um, you know, like it's a, obviously it takes a lot less time to, to double from 10 units up to, you know, a few thousand than it does from, you know, millions to billions to trillions it takes a lot, a lot longer to get the cost reduction when by the time you're at that, that phase. So if you look at like the German government, their policies in the 2000s, it really encouraged um, solar power to, to be installed. That had a huge, a huge effect on the cost of solar. And um, the you know, Germans paid for that with their taxes because it wasn't um, a cost competitive top technology at that time, but the rest of the world <laughs> all, all benefited from it. And I mean, the, the climate benefits from it too, because now you just, you know, like, you don't have to be a climate activist to put solar panels on your roof. You just have to like saving money. That's the, you know, that's the only thing. So I think, yeah, getting in early on technology is um, supporting it is, is one big thing that governments can do. And then I think that the second big thing is by looking at what is, yeah, what's standing in the, in the way of the, you know, these already cost-effective technologies, what's standing in the way of, um, of more rolling out. And around the world, um, the main barriers for more solar and wind tend to be around transmission. You know, you, you, we build out our transmission to join big fossil fuel power plants, which are often located near, you know, a coal mine or, or, or something, built huge power lines to, to cities. But that's not the same place where wind and solar are necessarily very good. And also it's just you know, a lot more distributed. We need a lot more power lines to, to bring that efficiently in. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a huge problem in, in Australia and I know in the US as well. Um, and there's all sorts of other things yet yeah, largely to do with regulations, you, you know, like the playing field between fossil fuels and um, renewables, it's stacked in favor of fossil fuels just purely because that's a system that the, um, as the technologies that the system was, the regulations were written for. So there's a lot of that really boring stuff that I assume people in government love to love to work on. Um, there's a lot of gains to be to be made there, and they could make a huge huge difference. And it would probably be a lot cheaper than you know uh, a lot of the policies that you hear um, governments announcing and people advocating for. Yeah. Do you think just I mean. I'm thinking like the examples of, of cell phones back in you know in the 80s they were terrible and then in the 90s they they worked but they were still something only the very wealthy could afford and and now you know everyone has one including my 14 year old so um, where do you think we are in that in that spectrum when it comes to re renewable energies I mean how how soon are we going to cross that threshold of going from you know, this being a specialty technology to just 
it's everywhere and why would you not use it no matter what your political stripe? Yeah, it depends um, on which technology you're talking about and where you are. The fun thing about the energy transition is it's so um, localized, you know, there's different solutions for every every place and that and that makes it, you know, nice as an engineer because you'll never, <laughs> never run out of work to do. You don't just solve the problem once and you're done. Um, so, you know, if you look at some places in the world, wind and solar, uh, can already make up the vast majority of the grid without too much trouble. And so South Australia is an example of that where they've already, I haven't looked at the figures recently, but usually it's like, you know, over 60% for, you know, at least months months in a row um, of their electricity coming from those technologies. Um, and they did that pretty fast, like, you know, within a decade or so, they had a, a big statewide blackout a little while ago and it kind of spurred them into action to, you know, improve their grid and um, reduce electricity prices. And now there's times when they only have just a couple of gas generators running to, you know, keep the um, voltage and frequency right. Um, and everything else is from wind and solar. And they're running trials now to even get rid of that last little bit of um, fossil fuel by yeah, a few other technologies like um, synchronous condensers and um, grid forming uh, inverters. So that's that's really exciting. I recommend keeping keeping a track of what's going on in South Australia is kind of like leading um, the world. They're the they're the first um, first gigawatt scale grid in the world to have so much um, variable renewable generation. So that's interesting to watch. And then other places, you know, like we have just the easiest energy transition in Australia. A lot of the US is the same, definitely not Alaska. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like a, lot of, a lot of the US has the same same characteristics as Australia where you've got a lot more space than you do population and, and energy demand. Um, really good sun resources in places and really good wind in other places and the ability to connect between them. So those conditions make it really easy. You don't need a lot of energy storage. Um, so I think, yeah, we'll see we'll see the rollout go from easiest to hardest. So that's electricity. Um, and then some of the other technologies uh, are at very close to inflection points. Like if you think about electric vehicles, so we're already getting to the point where like if you um, are buying a new fleet of um, vehicles for your business and look at the total cost of ownership over its lifetime, in many or maybe most cases, you're going to actually end up cheaper for your lifetime from electric vehicles because you don't have the you know fuel costs and um, your maintenance costs are a lot lower. And then I think we're predicting within five or less years, we're going to see that the, just the upfront purchase price of an electric vehicle is going to you know reach parity with a um, uh, a petrol car, um, a gas car. And you can imagine at that point, like it's not going to be this, you know, like really, really, really gradual increase of electric vehicles in the mix. It's going to be all of a sudden, like, why would you buy something else that's <laughs> that's more expensive? It requires you to go to a petrol station to fuel it. Um, you know, you're at the mercy of whatever political conflicts are going on for what, you know, price your fuel is going to be at and it, you know, it costs more upfront and it costs more to maintain. It's just a noisy. It's not going to be this continued gradual increase. It's going to be all of a sudden we're just only going to have electric vehicles pretty much. So, um, yeah, and I think if you look across all the different technologies, you see similar inflection points somewhere. And I do see that there's very few examples of things that are legitimately hard and will never, you know, reach, reach that parity. I had a list in the, the video and um, since since we recorded that, I've done, um, I've, I've worked with a couple of experts on different topics of that were in the hard to abate um, category in, in the talk we had, which I think was back in November, so quite a few months ago. So um, renewable heating is one that I thought was, you know, super, super hard to solve. And now talking to experts on it for some recent videos, I realised it's not not actually that hard. Um, you know, there's thermal storage uh, in in Canada and in Scandinavia that's getting 90% efficiency to store uh, to store solar power from the summer and use it in the winter for heating. Um, and yeah, there's there's a wide range of technologies available that can really complement what's happening in electricity. And then the other one is steel, where I um, I interviewed this. This guy who's an expert in working with hydrogen 
and with steel for yeah for over a decade and my first question to him was oh why is steel a hard to abate sector and he said oh steel's not hard to abate steel's one of the low-hanging fruits and you know he he went into this big explanation of um of how how easy it is and all the the action that's in in motion already so I think we'll see that more and more you know over this decade as things that we thought were just intractable problems actually turned out to have solutions now that we have the incentive to to um, implement them interesting i you boy you talked about a lot of th things that were really interesting i want to ask you more about um and just a reminder everyone else here if you have questions don't be shy to ask um because I, I could talk all day about this stuff um so i'm curious about electric cars um it seems like since the last time I priced a Tesla, the price has gone up. And my understanding is, is that because of lithium shortage issues. And I was curious what you see are the, the, the potential bottlenecks and breakthroughs that uh, will correspond to that transition of electric cars coming down in price so that it is com uh, you know, cost competitive upfront with uh, gas powered vehicles. Yeah, so it's really interesting, um, lithium prices and it's like commodity trading is pretty far away from mechanical engineering. So it's kind of interesting for me that all of a sudden I'm like really interested in, in how these kind of um, yeah, global commodity markets work. Um, but to me, it's kind of reminiscent of if you have a look at the, the graph for solar prices that, you know, the, it's come down just, just dramatically over the years. Um, but there are a few blips in it where for a year or two, the price went up. Um, and one of the reasons for that was because the price of um, silicon wafers went ma massively up for a period. There was, you know, demand increased very quickly. Supply couldn't keep up and the, the price just jumped. And I can imagine, I wasn't paying that much attention at the time, but I imagine in those years where it had just gone up two years in a row, the price, everyone's like, oh, okay, this is um, the end of price reductions for solar. This is where we're going to end up or now it's going to increase. Um, but you see that, you know, when the price was something that's abundant, like, you know, silicon um, or lithium as well, I think it's like the 33rd most common um, uh, element in the in the Earth's crust or something like that. You, you guys probably know more than me. I shouldn't, shouldn't say science figures because I'll probably get pulled up for being wrong. <laughs> anyway, it's very abundant. Um, as soon as the price for that goes massively up, well, then all of a sudden everybody wants to have a, um, a lithium mine and, you know, there's there's no shortage of places where you could extract lithium if you wanted to. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, how, you know, there's better resources and, and worse resources and it's not so quick to set up a mine and um, processing as well. So I, I don't know, and it could be that lithium becomes a... a you know, like a choke point, in which case there are alternative kinds of batteries that would eventually, you know, become more favorable. But I suspect that we'll see like a little lump in the price of lithium and then um, more decreases. That's that's what I expect to see. But, you know, we'll, we'll see in five or 10 years if, if I was right. Interesting. Well, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, since we're talking about economy and so on, I, I also I just wanted to mention that I, I'm not sure I entirely agree with one of your points, and it may be because I'm in Canada and, and not in Australia. But you were saying we shouldn't spend a lot of uh, expend a lot of effort in, in fighting fossil fuels. Well, um, I feel like we should in Canada because we have this uh, damn Trans Mountain uh, expansion pipeline that's being built from. The Alberta tar sands, they like to call it oil sands, but it's really tar sands from uh, across across our province um, to Vancouver, where it's going to be shipped and, and refined. And our country is supposedly, our government is supposedly concerned about climate change. And, um, <clears throat> and there is a carbon tax in effect and so on. But the argument being that we'll sell all this, all this stuff. Uh, to make money, which will help us make the t uh, a change to uh, our, our economy, make it greener, which you know, the argument <laughs> doesn't doesn't entirely make sense for a, a number of reasons. Um, which brings me to the point where you, uh, in your talk, you were talk, you said how renewables are so much more competitive now with fossil fuels than they used to be, which yeah. is great. That's wonderful. Um, but I'm also thinking that you know the economy is kind of a, a an artificial thing, and you know. If you listen to conservatives, they make it sound like it's, 
you know, a natural thing of the free economy. And it's not, it's, 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 it's artificial. So it's actually stacked in favor of, of fossil fuels and against renewables. And yet re renewables have become competitive with fossil fuels, which is great. But the problem is with this, the way the economy is set up, um, companies do not pay as much as they should to keep things clean. Like when they extract resources, they're supposed to clean up afterwards and they don't always do a good job or their products end up polluting and they're not recycled as much as they should be. And they should be, you want to get to a circular economy. Um, so if the economy becomes a little bit more um, natural, so to speak, reflects what's happening to the planet, economists call what's happening to the planet externalities, which is ridiculous. <laughs> um, but if it becomes much more natural and we have sort of a circular economy, what can we do as a group? I mean, you, you, um, what can you do in your job, for example, to help us get to this more natural economy? I mean, there's going to be a lot of resistance from big business, of course, but how do we get mm -hmm. there? Well, so there's a few points to that. And I will say that I do agree with you that these like big infrastructure projects that are just like being built now for fossil fuels, those are the, some of the things that dismay me the most about politics. And I do think that those are worth opposing. Uh, I see the same thing when people are, um, you know, building out new um, networks or, you know, places that don't have existing gas distribution networks building those out now I'm like just just don't because it will really lock you into thinking that that's a yeah. you know there's just there's no need um and I, I would say that that that's similar I, I mean I definitely also oppose like you know building new um coal coal ports the Australian government had a great idea to build one in the um, Great Barrier Reef recently um you know stuff stuff like that yes yeah, definitely yeah, yeah, it's wow. still going That's ahead. In, in, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, our, go our government is um, is not. They don't even attempt to seem um, progressive like uh, your your government does. At least, you know, it's, you, you can argue about how um, you know climate friendly the Canadian government actually is, but at least they want to appear that way, um, which yeah. ours does. And um, oh, they hope to internationally, but they don't. They specifically want to appear, you know, unfriendly to the climate domestically. So it's kind of a weird, a weird situation. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I agree with you on on that. Um, maybe it should be more clear. There's like, you know, there's certain types of um, arguing against fossil fuels that I think is a waste of effort because it's going to happen anyway. Um, and then there's other ones where it's, you know, locking locking in emissions well into the future. And I definitely think those are still worth um, worth opposing. And then I think you asked um, what you can what you can do to get you know the environmental outcomes more in balance with the economy, and yeah. that's an interesting point because in Australia we had at least ten years, maybe tw you know, tw like probably twenty years of arguing about a, a price on carbon, and we had one briefly, um, and then it was removed by the the next government, and that was the time when. Um, I was just so depressed about the, <laughs> the state of politics that I literally left the country to get away from it. Um, and I 100% agree that a price on carbon would be just the best thing and we should have had it since, you know, 2000. And um, things would be very different now if we had had that. But I have also, I never talk about it anymore because I just know that we will never have that in Australia. And so I don't even want the opposition party to have that as a policy because I know they won't they won't get in if they, um, you know, if they mention the word price on carbon. So I do irrationally just avoid the most efficient nice solution to <laughs> to everything um for political reasons and because i'm australian um so yeah I, I do think that you need to need to factor that in um yeah there was another point i think that you asked yeah, about that I i'm not sure how i mean the, the idea is that I, I i want to see companies pay for everything including you know the recycling and and pay um, part of the pollution they put out is carbon. So they should be paying for the carbon that they put out because it, it's an incentive for them to produce less carbon. Um, so how do we get to that? How do we how do we help drive the point home that we need to have an economy that's more reflective of what's happening to the planet? That's something where I do see that activists have been doing a really good job and it, they've succeeded in a way that I never expected them to actually. Um, right. So you see actually big companies doing things that don't make business sense from a pure, you know, um, 
cost point of view, but because of public pressure, they're doing it. So some examples are like, um, like IKEA and Amazon are some of the biggest drivers for electric, electric trucks to use for local deliveries because their customers want it and it makes them look good. Um, and then there's some other bigger things like Google is moving towards, they've already got, you know, their net zero commitment, but, um, you know, net zero is a lot easier than absolute zero. And they're moving towards 24 seven renewable electricity, which, which is a big deal and doing some really smart things um, in terms of, you know, choosing when they, they run their data centers. They've got, you know, a lot of things that can be done any time of day, like when they're upgrading, um, I don't know, the Google Translate algorithm or, or whatever, um, choosing which server your search gets sent to, depending on what has the cleanest electricity, um, yeah, stuff, stuff like that and some energy storage. So those are kind of challenging end of the energy transition problems that they're solving, you know, a decade or two um, ahead of what probably, you know, country electricity grids will. And uh, I mean, why? Why are they doing that? It's obviously because people, people care. People are pushing, pushing on them, putting pressure on them. Um, and I've seen a lot of people that I know, ex-colleagues and friends who have in the, their workplace have, have done something similar. You know, I had a friend who um, at my old job who said, you know, we're a wind energy company, we should be net zero. And so she pushed that through. It was the first, first wind um, energy manufacturer to do that, then expanded it to the whole of GE renewables. Um, and I know uh, another friend was um, really was concerned about wind turbine blade recycling. And so she just pushed and pushed and pushed for years until the, the company, you know, agreed with her and has a, a big program now. So I think that that, that is really working. Um, the idealist in me thinks that that's not the way that it should be done. What should happen is that you should vote for governments um, who have your values and you know, put, install regulations so that companies have to live by the values of the, um, you know, societies that they operate in. But uh, I'm, you know, I'm an engineer and I'm pragmatic and I see that that just, <laughs> that I wish the world worked like that, but it just doesn't seem to. And um, I don't think we have time for this big <laughs> societal change away from capitalism. You know, I think the fastest way to solve climate change is to work within it. So yeah, I'm no huge fan of capitalism, but I do see it as the fastest way to, to solve the energy transition. So in that sense, I am a fan of it at the moment. Yeah, I'm not sure capitalism is necessarily a problem itself, but the circular economy where everything's recycled, that could be if you change the rules. But, you know, I'm of two minds. On the one hand, I can see, yes, things are changing, so that's good. But on the other hand, you know, we don't really have time to be patient. Um, that's, that's, that's what worries me, right? Mm. Yeah, I agree. But you do have to remember that the vast majority of emissions are from things that are well underway with the, the changes and that just are unstoppable, you know, mostly electricity and then transport um, would be the next main one. I mean, for that, we don't need a lot of, of change to the system. It's the last remaining 20% or so that is the, the hard thing. And so that is where we should be putting our effort as long as, you know, we've done everything we can to speed up the easy stuff, which currently I say we, we haven't done all the easy stuff yet. Um, I don't think any country is really doing a good job of, of, you know, like actually project managing this so that you, you know, you do that, the easy things first that will allow really rapid changes and, um, and then, you know, in, in parallel and later on you focus on the, the, the harder parts and the politically harder parts as well. Right. Thanks. Rosie, I'm curious. Uh, so among scientists in general, and this is true of astronomers as well, uh, we're very reluctant to advocate for solutions. We, um, you know, it's sort of the ivory tower effect, maybe. We, you know, we should just be disseminators of information and knowledge, and then it should be up to politicians and, and policy wonks and whatnot to decide how to do it. And I'm just curious, you know, amongst engineers, is there a, a similar sentiment? And if not, what are ways that, I mean, obviously your channel, you know, presents all these great solutions. What are, what are some tips or advice you have for people who might be reluctant to, to advocate for solutions? I think there's a really inherent difference between like you kind of pinpointed the exact, exact difference between a scientist and an engineer um, because an engineer is taking, you know, other people's science and come using it to 
create solutions for for problems. And so I think automatically you end up knowing what the the best solutions are and you don't feel any qualms to advocate for them because you've done the work and you know that this is the the best solution or at least you believe it is. Um, So I think that there is some inherent difference. And of course, a scientist is going to be more reluctant that your job is to describe the the problem primarily um, and then to move from that to the solution when that's not your primary expertise of of course that's going to make you uncomfortable so I would probably suggest teaming up um, more more teaming up between scientists and engineers and I will say that I mean scientists I I know early in the um, climate crisis people were very despairing about no one listens to scientists and scientists are terrible communicators and you know that sort of thing but I um I don't know if it was true then, but I definitely don't see that it's true now. I see a lot of um, scientists are being paid attention to and there are so many good science communicators out there. I don't see people paying attention to engineers and I don't see good engineering communicators. So maybe we're 10 years behind. Maybe it took yeah an extra 10 years for people to start listening to scientists, climate scientists, than they should have. And now I think, you know, we're, <laughs> we're a few years behind when we should have started listening to engineers about the, the, the solutions. So um, I, I am definitely looking to the best um, science communicators to, to get tips because, yeah, I mean, engineering communication, there's, there's just so, so little of it. Uh, who, who knows any famous engineering um, communicators? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't even know any and <laughs> I am one. So it's... Uh, yeah, I, I think that I, I, we, I think people we know one with a the... YouTube channel, right? We know one with a YouTube channel called Rosemary Barnes, right? So there's <laughs> yeah. one there. <laughs> you know, you know, one one with uh, with a few tens of thousands of subscribers. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, there's a lot of a lot of famous science communicators. I, I think we've kind of uh, maybe we're stuck in stuck in the past of um, you know thinking that scientists have <laughs> done such a bad job. I actually see that you know scientists have definitely got the message across um, by now. And of course, it's frustrating that it didn't happen in the 90s. Um, but um, yeah. Uh. <laughs> I, th- I mean, there's, I think scientists ha- have learned a lot and still have a lot to learn about communication. My, my wife is a mm. journalism and public communication specialist. And so I've learned a lot from her mm. about, uh, you know, how, how to get your messaging across, you know, and, and in the and in the uh, corporate world, there is there is a whole field for that. You know, crisis communications. What does a company do uh, when they're they're caught releasing a product that's dangerous? You know, how did Volkswagen handle? You know, when it was caught uh, with its its diesel problems, and and so messaging is is very big part of it. I think scientists, maybe engineers, are um, inclined to to think, well, we have the facts and figures, we have the numbers, we have. Uh, and that's and that's enough that people will just simply listen to that. And often, I think scientists have assumed that the problem is people don't understand it well enough. Where really the problem is is people don't know what to do. And that's the thing I see most of all is, and then I say to my students is saying, okay, I you know, n- even though I live in a petro state like Alaska, I have very few students who are skeptical about climate change. They really just are concerned and they're overwhelmed and they're despondent and they want they want to know what we can do and so um, I find it myself spending a lot of time watching your channel and other resources to learn about those solutions because I feel like that's my role now is just to help people understand what's out there and what to look forward to and in the process I'm getting pretty darn excited about some of the cool things. I, I saw your video the other day about cooling off solar panels so they're more efficient and then you get the heat and you and you it's a win-win. Well, here in Alaska, we have naturally cooled solar panels, so that's not an issue. But <laughs> but you know, but that's an interesting example of a problem creating leading to a solution that is something you'd want to do anyway, aside from the issue of climate change. So I'm kind of rambling at this point, but um, I'm just curious, like you, you mentioned this, uh, this wind company that felt that they needed to walk the walk and, and go, uh, you know, net zero. Is that something the engineering community is talking about more as, as a whole, that they feel a responsibility to, you know, live the values that they're trying to 
you know, developed? To some extent, um, but actually, I mean, early in my career, definitely, that's everybody that was, you, you know, working for renewable energies was a, a passionate true believer. But actually one of my main reasons for optimism with the energy, tra energy transition now is that it's changed and now there are plenty of people working in, you know, wind energy companies or, or whatever kind of clean tech company, plenty of people that don't, don't care about climate change. I had climate skeptics working with me at, um, you know, when I was working at the manufacturer in, in Denmark, wind turbine manufacturer in Denmark. Um, and to me, that just shows how it's just a good technology now. And um, I wish that everybody in the world cared, cared about um, the planet, but I also saw how, frustratingly slow progress was when it was only those people that cared that were doing anything and how fast thing move, things move now that, it, you know, most people like money and now everybody who likes money is interested in, um, in renewables um, and, yeah, the energy transition. So I don't see it as being, being necessary, but for people who do, do care and want to do something, there are, you know, opportunities to improve all, all kinds of, companies um yeah where big big improvements to be made even in renewable energy companies and it is kind of easy to fall into the trap of saying oh you know well i work for a clean energy company so i'm doing my part and i don't need to need to do anything else um but you know like a removal of uh, emissions from the from the atmosphere it doesn't matter if it comes from you know a high point or a, a already a low point you still get the benefit from taking taking more out of the the atmosphere so yeah i think there's space for all kinds of all kinds of people in the energy transition now yeah. well that actually brings me to the last question i wanted to ask you and that is uh what do you think of the future of carbon sequestration i've, I've seen mm -hmm. a couple of your videos it's i mean it seems like the consensus is still it's an immature technology do you think we're close to a transition point where that will become uh, a major part of uh the solution um, short answer, no, I don't think it's close. Um, much longer answer. It's actually a topic of my, my next video that I'll release will be on you know, uses for, for carbon, you know, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and using it for something. You know, you make diamonds out of it or you can make um, synthetic fuels or uh, plastics or, you know, a bunch of stuff. So that's a topic that people talk about a lot but there is never the scale potential for that to be, you know, like a big part of the, the solution. It's just a way to make, you know, some existing problems a bit smaller. That's probably the best you can say for it. I will eventually do a, a video on storage as well, but it's a really interesting topic. Um, it's one that I started looking into because you hear really conflicting things. On the one hand, most people that are involved in the energy transition, you know, people like me, are very dismissive of um, carbon capture and storage as being just a total um, fig leaf for the fossil fuel industry, um, which I think it is, but I don't think that that's all that it is. Um, because when I looked into it a little bit, I could see that, you know, very qualified um, and experienced and smart people telling me that, you know, writing reports saying that these technologies are, are mature. Um, and then I just wanted to answer the question if these technologies are mature and we've been trying for so long so hard to achieve it why why isn't it happening um eventually came to the answer of um economics you know there's no price on carbon so why <laughs> it doesn't matter how mature a technology is if there's cost you money to to implement it and you don't you know make any money then why would someone choose to do that so that's that's a simple answer but it's a really challenging um topic to have a conversation about because you definitely make all climate activists, um, anybody working on renewable energy, all get really angry at anybody um, being anything but very negative about carbon capture. Um, because, well, my opinion on, on why that is, is because, you know, historically it's just been used as an excuse to not do anything about climate change. It's like, you know, in Australia, it started with clean coal. <laughs> we can keep on doing everything exactly as normal. We just put carbon capture and then everything will be fine. And then we've spent billions and billions of dollars on it in Australia and captured almost nothing. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at any of the scenarios for net zero, any of the scenarios that do not lead us to catastrophic warming, they all involve 
um, carbon capture and storage, and it's not to replace renewables. It, it can't do that because by adding carbon capture and storage, you add energy requirements. You know, it takes a lot of energy to even just to capture it out of the flue gases from a fossil fuel power plant. So a, a lot of energy adds like 25, 30% of energy onto that, um, the needs of that, that power plant. Um, and if you try and suck it out of the air, it's just, you know, like immensely more energy that you need um, to do that. So it can never be carbon capture and storage instead of renewable electricity. It has to be as well as, and it's to balance out some of the hard, hard to abate stuff, um, like really hard to abate stuff, like, you know, if you've got permafrost that's thawing and, um, you know, methane that's now going into the atmosphere, what are we going to do about, about that? Um, we can't, you know, go back in time or just concrete over these, these areas. So you're going to need we are going to need this technology in the future. So if nobody is allowed to talk about it or develop it, then how will it be ready when we need it, you know? So it's that, yeah, I, I'm, um, I think it's a really important topic. So I've been putting in a lot of effort to try, try and get that debate right. But I also know that every time I, I um, speak about carbon capture and storage that I get quite a backlash because people don't want to detract from the the real energy transition, which is, you know, renewable electricity mostly, um, I which, which the, I agree uh, with. I, I put in the chat a, a link to an article on karma sequestration into the concrete. They make concrete and they put carbon that's been sequestered into it. And since we're always going to need concrete, then you can store all the carbon dioxide in all, all the things that we build. So that's one way to get rid of the, car uh, the, the carbon. Yeah, that's um, yeah, it's cool. I haven't, I don't think I've seen that article, but I'll I'll take a look. That definitely one of the one of the more significant things that you can do with with carbon is to um, yeah, mineral carbonation and um, putting it in concrete and um, biochar is the other one that can actually work on some sort of scale. So yeah, but it's it's never going to stop us from having to move to renewable electricity i don't think that you're suggesting that it that it does but um yeah no there's there's a lot of good good research happening in that area definitely okay well i want to be respectful of your time thank you again rosie for meeting with us today uh, again this recording will be online for the rest of our viewers and uh Again, I, I just want to put in a shameless plug for Rosie's YouTube channel. There will be a link in, in the video for it. Uh, but I have really enjoyed all of the videos you've made that talk about these cool technologies that are coming out. And as others have said, we, you know, it's not just one solution, it's all the solutions. And so uh, it's really been interesting uh, to learn about all the things that are coming about and how they're going to not only address climate change, but also just make life more interesting and healthier and better for everyone. So thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. If you're interested in Astronomers for Planet Earth, you can learn more at our website, astronomersforplanet.earth, and on social media as well. If you would like to be notified about future talks and events, please follow and join us.